How many of you remember the first experiments you ever did in science when you're at primary school? Anybody? Um, it's not something that we, we often talk about, but it's good for us to think back to the first experiences that we had with science, and whether you're a scientist or just someone interested in science, thinking about what it was that first engaged you. You may not remember the first science experiments you did in school, but if I was to ask you, do you remember a TV advertisement that you saw when you were under 10 years of age, you probably do remember that. Now, there's a good reason for this, and it's because marketing companies are really good at getting us to remember things. Unfortunately, in science, this is not a skill that many scientists have. It's not our job to help people to remember things, or at least we don't think it is, but actually in reality, it's very important that we do remember the science that we're taught. Back in 1984, I was in year seven at school. And one of the things that we were given was this amazing kit. And it allowed you to take a cigarette. You could smoke this cigarette through a particular vessel that you could put filter paper in using a syringe and it would extract the tar. And this gave us a very, very strong image of what was going into people's lungs when they were smoking cigarettes. It was hands-on, which really mattered. That helps you remember things. It gave an unexpected result which is always another thing that helps you remember things when you're curious and then what comes out is unexpected. And it's also very simple. It's easy to see, it's easy to understand. And for us kids in year seven at the time, this was something that we could remember really well. The second item was an amazing book that I had. The title was The World We Live In. In this book, it taught me something very important. It taught me that there were 31 moons in the solar system. We know now that Saturn and Jupiter alone have more than 120 moons. Most importantly for me, though, it taught me how mountains were made. This is the part that ended up being incorrect. And let me quote from the book. It said, As the Earth's interior cooled, it probably shrank away from the outer crust, like the skin of a drying apple. The Earth's crust wrinkled, forming mountains and valleys. Now, at the time, there was no real mention of tectonic plates or the precursor to that continental drift theory. This is another example of really clear communication where we, in the end, had to update our knowledge. A really interesting aspect of the way we communicate science is, is taking into account the longevity of the messages that we put out and how hard it is to actually remove them or, or modify them down the track. And a really good example of this at the moment is the way in which we've pushed very hard in certain areas of the pandemic. So there have been some people, for example, who've said children don't need to be vaccinated. Now, when you put out such a strong message like that, it becomes hard to get out of it. And so if you're more careful about it and you say, at this point in time, we're still looking at the risks associated with vaccination of younger, younger people. And once we've done that risk analysis, and we know that it's appropriate for kids to be vaccinated as a preventative strategy, we'll do that. Less of the absolutes, more of the well thought out, good communication of science. I think if we do that, it helps. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for those ideas to, to get across, especially when they're challenging ones and difficult ones that took a long, a long time and a lot of effort to communicate in the first place. I want to start off with a story that I find that is really interesting about the communication of risk and what that looks like in the broader context of other areas, in particular, in one case, which is seismology. Some of you may be aware of this beautiful town in Italy. It's called L'Aquila. It is a town that was devastated by a magnitude 6.3 earthquake on the 6th of April in 2009. Italy's Civil Protection Department, which was involved in coordinating any efforts with regards to earthquakes, because they were fairly common in the region, had a meeting on the 31st of March, exactly one week before the major quake. At that meeting, it was made really clear that although they could not rule out the possibility of a major quake, and it was always best to be prepared, there was no particular good reason to think a quake was coming. This is reasonable advice. Earthquake prediction is more or less impossible. Now, after the meeting of the government official and six seismologists, the deputy head, Bernardo de Bernardinas, went and spoke to the media. And he said that all these small shocks that people were experiencing were reducing the seismic stresses and lowering the chance of a major quake. But what the public wasn't told was that in order to take care of all the energy that would be released by an earthquake of magnitude 6.3, you would need in excess of 30,000 of these small quakes. And there were just in the tens of them occurring. So what he said was very misleading in that regard. 
at the very end of the press conference, um, he was asked whether or not people should just sit back and relax and have a glass of wine. And he was very prescriptive about this. He suggested absolutely a multi Puccioni doc, a local regional wine that people love, similar to the one you can see here. This type of communication of scientific ideas and threats and risks is not overly helpful. And it put all of the people in the city who watched this at ease at a level inconsistent with what might have been coming. As it turned out, the six seismologists and the one local civil protection officer ended up being sentenced to six years jail as a result of this miscommunication. After the scientists and the government official were sentenced, some 5,000 scientists around the world signed a petition to have the conviction overturned. The appeal was actually successful and all six scientists were released. Unfortunately for the government official, um, the judgment was not so kind and he served two years as a result of this. It's obvious in science that we can't always give absolute answers. We know this, that's the nature of science. Science is also evolving, so those answers can change. But what do the public expect? When they're making choices based on risk, it is very challenging to communicate the information that they need so that they can make those choices in an informed way. There are times when we need to educate the population and have them make their own decisions. Um, a good example of that is when we eat certain foods. It's really important for people to be understanding that certain foods are bad for them and that they should avoid them. That's, that's education, that's knowledge, that's upskilling them. On top of that though, there are things where we just, we need to put in place actions that make those things occur no matter what. Another example is seatbelts in cars. You know, whether you understand how seatbelts work or not is really not the core goal there. We know that seatbelts save lives. So we've put in place rules to make sure that happens. But I'm not gonna put in place a rule that stops you from eating chocolate. Communication of science matters. It's, it's something that's really come to the fore in recent times. And in terms of vaccinations and the pandemic, we've seen lots and lots of it. I think it was about 10, 12 years ago when I first started doing more and more interviews on my radio program on 3 R about vaccination. It was interesting because one of the things that had happened was as scientists, we had left a communication gap. We'd done so well with vaccinations over the years and such great uptake from the population um, that they were introduced in schools. We were just getting them routinely. It was very, very normalized that we stopped making the case for why they were so important. And we left a gap. We left a gap that some really inappropriate people started to step into. The power of vaccination is actually really old knowledge. Sometimes it feels as though it's recent, but actually it's really, really old knowledge. First introduced by Edward Jenner, who started the smallpox work in his laboratory in 1796. So at the moment we talk about the speed of vaccines and how quickly we're doing things, but keep in mind that the vaccines we have today have been built up on the knowledge of literally hundreds of years of work, starting with, with Jenner in 1796. We certainly did not produce them in a year. Our current pandemic has shown some extraordinary scientific successes, but it has also in many regards been outshone by some incredible scientific communication failures. All of our vaccines have side effects. That's true for every vaccine that you've ever had in your life. Here we started hearing about blood clots in the AstraZeneca vaccine um, uptake. That was very problem problematic for us. The numbers were unclear, but the media absolutely exploded on this issue as soon as it started. And we started seeing some really um, problematic headlines in some of our newspapers with regards to what was going on with AstraZeneca. And here's where the communication of science can really get out of step with reality. These are the sorts of headlines that were coming out locally just as we were trying to convince people of the importance of vaccination. Even some of our more sensible newspapers were producing large numbers of stories that everyone was seeing on the dangers associated with vaccinations. But fear spread very quickly as a result of some of the information on these vaccines. And one of the things that's interesting about fear, especially around science, is that it's very hard to put it back in the bottle once it's out. The media is a tool that we can use, but the media has its own set of KPIs and drivers these don't overlap with the drivers of scientists trying to get information to the public. What I would like to see is a lot more effort being put in by large organisations, science organisations, to communicate with the public more directly 
And I think this is something that we can do. If we wait for the media clicks, if we wait for the media to be interested, then it sort of falls into that category of, yes, there's fear stories and everyone loves that. But one of the things that we know is that people learn better when they're curious. Science is something that we can really make people curious about and people learn as a result of that. The communication of science has always been a challenge. We actually need more people trained in science, not scientists. Strong distinction. We need more people who are trained in science and we need more scientists who are trained in good communication of their science. I would love to see every scientist learning more and more about communication. It will serve them well in every aspect of their career and we just need to do more of it.